if you would please, turn into your Bible, to, uh, turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 1. <coughs> Jesus. 
While the bodily manifestation of Jesus in human form was a unique event, the soul that dwelled within that body existed from eternity past. Jesus, the Word, was in the beginning with the Father and always has been. So to begin our journey through Jesus' narrative, we stepped back to see Jesus' eternal pre-existence. And we also took note that Jesus' bodily incarnation is not the first appearance of God the Son in the history of redemption. When seen through the proper lenses, the Old Testament scriptures reveal to us that Jesus, or God the Son, has been an active participant in the efforts of God to move the world towards the pivotal event in God's plan of redemption. The divinity of Jesus Christ is a central doctrinal tenet of our Christian faith. Without it, we really have nothing. So spending the time we spent digging into that topic was time very well spent. Now, as the events that bring the incarnation to fruition have, have been prophesied since the fall of man at the beginning of recorded time, and as the plan of redemption progressed, there was more and more detail added to the prophecies concerning it. But then suddenly, God went silent for 400 years. There had been no prophet of God in Israel, nor had there been any communication from him in any other form for 400 years. So now that the fullness of time has come, what is God going to do? Is He going to just drop Jesus on everyone? After 400 years of silence from God, would anyone even remember that they were supposed to even be looking for a Messiah? After all that time, how many people even still believe that God existed, let alone still believe in that promise? Well, God has no plan to just drop Jesus in on the people of Israel. In fact, that was never the plan. The coming of the king would be preceded by a herald. The prophecies of the coming of the Christ included a prophecy that before he came, that there would be a final Old Testament style prophet who would prepare the people's hearts for and then his arrival when he came. The job of a herald is to draw attention to the coming of a dignitary. So getting people's attention is part of the job, right? God has set things up for this herald to garner maximum attention. His very conception is a miracle. And that miracle grabs people's attention. A whole lot of eyes are on the man we today call John the Baptizer from the minute that he arrives on the scene in Israel. Matthew, Mark, and John all bring John the witness, John the Baptizer, into Jesus' narrative as an adult. The announcement of John's birth and conception is exclusive to Luke's Gospel account. Luke's Gospel contains all the information that we have about John the Baptizer's birth and life prior to the start of his ministry. It is also the most extensive accounts of Jesus' pre-life ministry, including the announcement of his birth, his birth, and the only accounts of his days as a boy. I firmly believe that Luke received all of this information directly from Mary, the mother of our Lord. The only parts missing from Luke's accounts are the visit of the Magi from the East and the flight into Egypt, which are both only found in Matthew's account. The story of the Incarnation actually begins with the coming of the Herald of the Christ. And his story begins with a miraculous announcement of his coming and a rather miraculous conception. And that's where we're going this morning. Are you with me? Yes. Again, in verse 5 of Luke, chapter 1. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. So God includes details like in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, to help fix times and dates in history. The Bible is not primarily a history book, but the story it tells us actually took place in history. 
there are real, these are real events, and God made sure that his anointed writers fixed a timeline of when these events took place so that you can know that they really happened. Much effort has been put into destroying the timelines and historical markers placed within the Bible. And sometimes, for a while, those heresies, those lies, stick because um, they had no proof then. And, and men believed and proliferated those lies. We talked about that a lot during our introductions and the higher critics until God causes something to be uncovered which shows that they were fools to doubt his word. For example, for some time people called into question the accuracy of the gospel accounts because no one could find a record of there ever being a procreator, procurator by the name of Pontius Pilate in Judea. They had no record of him in, in Roman records. And that was until 1961 when they found a stone tablet with his name on it which verified his position and tenure as procurator over Judea in the ruins of Herod's temple. Herod's um, castle, palace, that's the word. <laughs> wow. Thank you. Um, thank you, Lord. Uh, they found it in the ruins of Herod's palace in Caesarea by the sea. Until God, um, times, dates, and numbers are important to God because He has a plan and a timeline for absolutely everything, and He tells the future based on those timelines. Sometimes He is vague and, and seems to be uh, because we don't understand the, the reference. But when it happens, there is no doubt that God called it ahead of time, even if we don't understand it at the time that He gave it to us. And that's the true point of prophecy. Prophecy is not given so we can stand around waiting for something to happen. Because what we would do is, like most humans, is we would wait until that very last minute to do anything. So God deliberately keeps his prophecies a bit vague. The point of prophecy is so that when it does happen, you will know that God made it happen. Just like he said he would. It's about displaying his power and bringing glory to his name. And it shows us, too, that God can be trusted. If he makes a promise and he keeps it, we can trust him. We can know that he is true to his word. The people who served in any capacity in the temple had to be descended from the line of Levi within the types of servers within the tribe of Levi um, were the priests. And the priests had to be from the line of Levi as well. They also additionally had to be descended from Aaron. So Zacharias was from the line of Aaron as well as Elizabeth, his wife. So any son that they had would be descended from the priestly line from both sides of his lineage. Their son would have the right to serve in the capacity of a priest to God in the temple. Now at this point in the gospel story, if we were to lay out the gospels linearly, which is actually what we're doing, right? We're laying out the gospels linearly or chronologically. If you see it all as one book, you will see when it's all put together, it actually contains the classic things that you would expect to see in a book. For instance, most books have a dedication, right? Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, which we didn't look at. Um, the book is actually dedicated to someone. And I think we kind of did two weeks of dedication, right? Looking at where it came from and who wrote it. Uh, Luke actually dedicates his writing to the most excellent Theophilus. Theophilus is most likely a real person, Luke's patron. But the name also means something. It means literally friend of God. 
So it could be that this whole of the gospel is dedicated to all who want to be a friend of God and seek him in the pages of these gospels. So we have a classic dedication. We also have a classic prologue in John 1, 1 through 18. Prologue is the story before the story, right? That's the story we looked at last week. Prologue, um, the pre-existence of God the Son, who would become the man Christ Jesus. We looked at that. That was our classic prologue, the story before the story. So what we are looking at this week would be chapter 1 of the actual story. Chapter 1, the opening sentence, the opening verse, the opening narrative of the opening chapter of the book of the gospel. And in this opening, there are some hidden clues in this first verse about what's to come in the rest of the book. There are five names mentioned. Five names mentioned in this opening verse. And each name has a rather stunning meaning. So the five names mentioned are Herod, Judah, Zacharias, Abijah, Aaron, and Elizabeth. The name Herod means heroic. The name Judah means he shall be praised. The name Zacharias means remembered of God. Abijah means my father is Yahweh. Aaron means light bringer. And Elizabeth means oath of God. The names mentioned in the opening of the book, one of which, one of which, one of those names is an ungodly, wicked, murderous king, just all happen to be names whose meaning say something about the central figure of the book who is yet unnamed. Does that feel like a coincidence? That's awesome, isn't it? <laughs> Heroic, he shall be praised, remembered of God, my father is Yahweh, light than that. Promise oath of God. <laughs> awesome. Um, and there's one other little tidbit that I don't think is a coincidence either. We are told that Zacharias is of the order of Abijah. The order of Abijah just happens to be the eighth division of the priests. And biblically, eight is the number of new beginning. Which is kind of what the whole story is going to be about, isn't it? A whole new beginning. I love it when God does that. Just, <laughs> just hides some stuff. Or... Verses 6 and 7 of Luke chapter 1. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well years. So it sounds a little bit like God is, is bragging on two of his kids, and he does that from time to time. He does, and I can't think of anything greater than to have God record it. Or just say, I, he doesn't even have to write it down, it's like to hear it, what, you're doing good, kid. You're doing good. Job comes to mind, the Old Testament, although that bragging didn't work out. Yes, it did work out great for Job. It, it was painful in between, but it did work out eventually really good for Job. So, when you look at this, though, um, please don't make this mistake. They're not righteous because they keep the commandments and ordinances. Works make no one righteous. Absolutely no one. New Testament or Old, the Bible says that the just shall live by faith. And they said that in the Old Testament. Faith in God's promises is what makes them righteous. Walking in the commandments and statutes is proof that they have that faith. But God is not bragging on them here. In fact, um, what he's doing is he's defending them. <coughs> the Jewish mindset is, was, that bad things don't happen to righteous people, ever. They believe that if someone had something bad happen to them, it was because you had done something wicked. 
there was some big sin in your life. Even if they couldn't see it, even if they didn't know it, the proof was that something bad was happening to you. Um, and that is actually what a lot of people, ancient people, thought inside of Israel and outside. And some still think that way. How many of us haven't seen something really horrible happen to someone gone, I wonder what they did. The life of Job happened um, and then was recorded and preserved to counter that idea. That's why the book of Job is this. To show us that, yes, bad things do happen to good people. But apparently few people in Israel got that point. Because the idea still persisted even when Jesus arrived on the scene. Even the disciples thought that way. Remember when they encountered the man who was born, born blind, they asked Jesus, this might qualify as the dumbest question yet. They asked Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents? He was born blind. Um, which would be kind of funny because it means he had to have committed some wicked sin in utero. But that's how pervasive the idea was. One of uh, probably the worst things that could happen to anyone at that time was to have no children. And only slightly less worse than having no children at all is having children but no son to carry on the family name. Women with no children were looked down upon in Jewish society. Right or wrong, that's the way it was. It was thought that they must have some secret sin in their life or the husband that only God knows about and so he has cursed her. That's the prevailing thought. So what God is doing here is defending them and teaching us a lesson. God will withhold or delay something we, uh, we think of as a blessing even to the faithful and righteous for His glory and our good. Usually both are true. And I promise you, I absolutely promise you that Zacharias and Elizabeth are not in heaven. When they got to heaven, they didn't go, really, you couldn't have brought it a little sooner? I was so old. Do you know what it's like keeping up with a toddler when you're 82? I promise you, they never said that. I promise you, they were never upset. In fact, they are, they are there now praising God that they got to be a part of his story part of his grand plan. Verses 8 and 9. So it was that while he was serving as priest before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. So, um, 1 Chronicles chapter 24 lays out for us that there were 24 divisions of the priesthood set up by David. Each division served for one week at a time. Divisions were changed out or rotated each Sabbath day. On the three high feasts, Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles, all 24 divisions served because there was so much to do. There were so many sacrifices to be made and offerings to be received. So all of them served during those three feasts. The rest of the time served one week and went home. Um, who got to perform certain duties, such as putting the incense on the altar, um, or doing the morning or the evening sacrifice, um, was drawn by lots. Names and a hat number, I don't know, whole amount. Um, there were said to be about 20,000 priests at the time when Jesus came. So having this lot fall on you was a once-in-a-lifetime event. 
uh, priests served from 25 or 30, depending on where in uh, the history it was. Uh, I believe God set up as 30, David moved it back to 25, and then he stopped serving at 50. So over a 25 to 30 year period, the chance of being pulled out of 20,000 to do this was pretty slim, pretty thin. Um, so it just so happens to be the week for Zacharias' division, and out of the hundreds of men there to serve during that week, the lot for going into the holy place of the temple itself just happened to fall on Zacharias. Before we leave the source, I want to point something out to you here. Um, remember when we talked in our introductions about how we can discern who the writers intended their gospel account to go to? Um, by what details they included, we see that here. Dr. Luke is the writer of this passage, and we said that his intended audience was Greek-speaking Gentiles outside of Israel. You can see that here because he includes so much detail about the inner workings of the Jewish rituals. Jews would know this. Even Gentiles living within Israel proper would probably know about this. However, Gentiles living outside of Israel would know nothing about it. So having these details, they're important to the story. They, they really show how miraculous this event is, and so Luke includes those details because that's his intended audience. I want you to see an example of that while we're here. Verse 10. And the whole multitude of the people was praying outside at the hour of incense. Now according to Exodus 37 and 8, incense was to be added to the altar of incense in the morning and at twilight one when the priest was tending to the lamps in Nora. No indication as to which of these two times it was. Commentators seem to think that it was uh, the morning, but we don't see that actually mentioned specifically. What we do know is that a whole lot of people, a whole multitude of people, um, are outside praying. The rising smoke of burning incense was symbolic of prayer ascending to heaven. So part of the ritual here uh, was after the priest had added the incense to the altar, he would linger um, there before the altar, before the curtain, which is before the Holy of Holies, and pray for the needs of the nation. So this is also the time when people would gather outside of the temple specifically to pray. The point is uh, that there are a whole lot, a bunch of witnesses outside who are going to see what is about to happen. Or at least the aftermath of what is about to happen. Verse 11, Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing on the right side of the altar of incense. Again, uh, according to how God laid things out this time in Exodus 36, the altar of incense was to be set in the holy place, centered in front of the veil that covered the entrance to the holy of holies, where the Ark of the Covenant would have set. Um, and this is that same veil, that exact same veil that was torn from top to bottom when Jesus dies, when Jesus breathes his last breath, this curtain, which actually at this point is it's like 18 inches thick. It's layer upon layer upon layer, and it's just going to be ripped, torn from top to bottom. It's, it's probably as high up as the ceiling. It's, it, it's huge. The temple is gigantic, and that whole thing is going to be ripped from top to bottom so that you know that nobody got out there and did it. Even one at a time, even one layer at a time, it had to have been God that did it. So it's that veil and that altar that Zacharias is standing in front of. Um, but of course, the ark is not there at this time. We don't know where the ark is. The last mention of it is during the reign of King Josiah in 2 Chronicles 35 3. What happened to it, we don't know. It's possible that the Egyptians or the Babylonians took it during one of their conquests. Some think that the priests hid it away before the conquering nations descended upon Jerusalem. Followed Jerusalem and the exile into foreign lands with God's judgment. 
for Israel's idolatry and wickedness. Or maybe God just took it back because they had broken the covenant so many times that it was just a joke at that point, at least to the people of Israel. It wasn't a joke to God, which is why maybe he took it back. If they weren't going to preserve it, he would. Because that's the kind of God we have. Even when we're unfaithful, he continues. When we give him every reason to be unfaithful to us, he continues to be faithful to us. We don't know uh, what happened to it, but some are convinced that it is still out there somewhere, and so people will continue to search for it. You'll catch a special on that on some channel somewhere. Search for the other coming. Good luck. <laughs> maybe it is, I don't know, but it's been 2,000 plus years, maybe 3,000 at this point, so good luck. Uh, so this temple was laid out as directed by God um, and, and laid out as follows. The, the door or entry into the place would have faced east, and I have no idea where I'm standing at the moment. Um, it used to be that way. So the, it, it always faces the sun coming up. That's the door to the temple, which means the Holy of Holies behind the curtain would be to the west. Altar of incense directly centered in front of that. And then before that veil, we got the altar of incense. So to the south or to the left would be the golden lampstands, the menorah. And to your right or the north would be the table of showbread. Um, and the angel of the Lord, so he appears right here. Which would be to the right hand side, be to the north. Now the temple was a replica, get this, of the throne room of God in heaven. And I, I, I think perhaps we get the detail of exactly where the angel is standing in this place because it's the place he normally occupies in heaven. This is the place when we get to heaven where Gabriel will be standing. He stands at the left hand of God, ready to serve him. Verse 12. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. So we get a two-part reaction. So the priest who offers the incense is part of actually a three-man team. Two guys, two guys carry coals, which they take from the altar of sacrifice, which God lit. Everything has to be lit off of what God lives. So they take coals off of the altar of sacrifice and they carry it in with Zacharias, um, who's there to do the actual incense. Um, and while they're getting the coals, he's preparing the special incense, which uh, was a special blend that could only be used in the temple. If you used it outside of the temple, you would curse. So the three of them proceed into the temple. The two coal bringers place the coals on the altar. And then they turn and leave. And at that point, Zacharias would pour the incense over the coals and then begin to pray. So and, and Zacharias prays, closes his eyes. That's not hard to imagine. He closes his eyes and he begins to speak to God about the needs of the people of Israel. And then he opens his eyes and there's a guy standing. And that at first is going to freak him out because like, I'm the only one who's supposed to be in here. And when you do things wrong in the temple of God, sometimes you don't make it out. So this would be troubling. Um, and then he realizes that it's really not a person standing there, but an angel. And now he's afraid. Angels simply... The word simply means messengers of God must be pretty imposing figures. We know that the fallen angels in Genesis that had relations with women produced offsprings that were giants. So I'm thinking they're pretty big. And then in, um, 
In verse 19, we're going to hear that this angel stands in the presence of God. So I would also add that they probably glow or radiate light. Where do I get that from? Well, Moses glowed after just witnessing God's vapor trail. His glory as it passed by caused Moses' whole body to glow. So if this guy is standing in the presence of God all the time, I would assume that he probably glows too. So you've got a giant glowing guy standing there <laughs> in the temple with you. So I think we can safely conclude that angels are very large and probably radiate light, and that's not something you see every day. And that would cause some fear, especially considering the circumstances surrounding the encounter. We're standing in the temple of God. Verse 13. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. King James renders this simply as fear not. The word translated here as fear is the Greek word phobo, phobio, uh, which is where we get our English word phobia from. It means a fear of something. The way this word is parsed, though, the tense given to it in the Greek, it would be better rendered as stop being afraid, as in you were, now stop, and it's delivered as an imperative or a command. So the angel is like, stop being afraid, come on. And the why is funny, because there seems to be a disconnect here. Um, the why is because your prayer is heard. Alright, how does that help you with a large glowing guy standing in the temple? <laughs> heard, the word heard, in the original Greek is rendered in an aorist tense, which means um, it's hard to figure out. Uh, aorist tense is a unique quirk in the Greek language. It is a verb with no actual indication of past, present, or future tense. It's just always happening. This, this actual sense of the word cannot be um, replicated in the English language. And so they have to give it a tense because we don't have an aorus tense word. So as it's rendered here in English, is heard would lead one to think it was just prayed or a, that Zacharias had just prayed a prayer for his son. But the actual ARS tense in the original language would suggest that it was an ongoing prayer. Or something that he had prayed for, or it could also be something he prayed for years ago and then dropped. We have no sense of when the prayer was actually prayed. So, what we do know uh, is that he, at some point, has prayed for a child. Whether that's fresh or old, we don't know. Considering that both he and his wife were old, I would speculate that it was a prayer that Zacharias had prayed for many years ago, but had, and, and continued to pray for a very long time, but had dropped as his wife Elizabeth advanced beyond childbearing years. I don't think that knowing when he asked God for a son is important, because the power in prayer is not in the one who prays, but in the one who hears prayers. And our prayers, no matter when we pray them, are always fresh in God's ears. I think that is the point here. No tense. It's always been heard. No matter when you pray to God, your, your requests are always fresh in God's ears. According to the angel, um, that, the fact that God always hears your prayers and your, your prayers are always fresh in His ears should be enough to stop being afraid of a growing giant who suddenly appears in the temple. Do we know how precious the fact that God listens to us is? How many other religions and how many other gods have been perpetrated on man where you have to beg for his attention? The real God, the true God, is always listening to you. He hears everything you have to say to him, every request that you make of him, and it's always as if you just prayed it. It's always fresh in his ears. And 
that should allow us to walk out in the world bold and no matter what glowing giant thing appears in front of us, I have God's ear. What do I have to do for you? I have God's ear. So, yeah, stop being afraid for your prayers are heard. That's pretty powerful. Finally, the angel tells him you shall name the child John. John is in English, a, a poor English translation of the Hebrew name Yohanan. Yohanan. I don't know how you get John out of Yohanan. I think it went to Hebrew and then the English. Uh, but the actual Hebrew name is Yohanan, which means Yahweh is gracious or Yahweh is a gracious giver. His name is a testament to the world that God answered Zechariah's prayer for the son. And as well, we'll see in a moment that it is also an answer to the prayers that he probably just prayed for that nation because God is a gracious giver. Verse 14 in the first part of verse 15. And you will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. The angel of the Lord begins to prophesy about this promised child. He tells Zacharias that he will have great joy over this birth, and that's not hard to imagine under the circumstances, especially an old guy suddenly gets a baby, and there's going to be some hooting and howling. But also that many others will rejoice at his birth, and that is a prophecy you will actually see fulfilled just a few weeks from now. This is a remarkable birth. It would evoke memories of Abraham and the birth of Isaac. It will garner much attention, and I think that is the design, is to grab people's attention. But notice the four here. The gladness and the rejoicing. Four. This child will be a source of joy because he will be great in the eyes of Yahweh. And that is what really counts. You can raise a child in the nicest of homes, in the best of neighborhoods, clothe them with the absolute best clothes, feed them with the most succulent, wonderful tasting food, nutritious everything, send them to the very best schools, but if you don't raise them to know, love, and follow Yahweh, then you will have failed them. No matter what your child grows up to become, it will be nothing if they do not have a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. That will uh, make them great in the eyes of God. And when this world is over, and all of your worldly accomplishments, and all the stuff that you've accumulated burns to nothing. All that will matter is being great in the eyes of God. And you only get that way by knowing Jesus Christ. If we teach our children nothing else, we teach them to know and love and follow God. That's part of 15 and verse 16. And shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many to the children, many of the children of Israel, to the Lord their God. So the angel continues to prophesy over his child's life. And just a side note: if you want to be used powerfully by God, staying away from alcohol is always a good idea. I cannot tell you how many pastors, and I'm not anti-alcohol, and, and I don't think drinking alcohol is a sin. Drunkenness is a sin. But I cannot tell you how many pastors I've watched and heard of and read the stories of where their fall begins when they started drinking. I don't know how that happens. I just pray to God it doesn't happen. So staying away from alcohol and being used powerfully by God seem to have some crossover. Now some have speculated that John was a Nazarite. They don't believe that the text supports this view. Yes, John will be set apart for the Lord like a Nazarite. 
But the only requirement of a Nazarite that we know of that he is supposed to adhere to here was staying away from wine and strong drink. Yes, that's a good part of it. But the Nazarite vow, which is laid out in Numbers 6, Numbers chapter 6, 1 through 21, goes a whole lot further than that. There's a whole lot more to it. Perhaps it's implied, but I, I don't see it that way. When John announced the birth of Samson to his parents in Judges 13, 7, he was very very specific that the child would be a Nazarite from the womb. That's not said here. God is entirely consistent, so I believe if John was meant to be a Nazarite, I think the angel would have said so. The angel then tells Zacharias, he will also be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. Take note of this one. Remember this one because we're going to look in a couple of weeks and see just incredible evidence of the truth of this prophecy. So I want you to remember this one. And finally, he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. So in other words, what this child is going to grow to do is lead a revival. A revival amongst the children of Israel. But the sad part is, is it will not be a complete revival. Only some will respond. Verse 17, he will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. I think this is probably the most stunning line in this whole conversation. Please take note of the hymn. If you have the New King James Bible, the hymn in he will also go before him is capitalized. So the he, at the beginning, as in Zacharias' son, will go before him. Again, the New King James capitalizes it correctly, which makes it easy to see the true glory of this child's calling. This is his true and greatest mission. The him that John the Witnesses will go before is the Christ. John is to be the herald of the Christ. His job is to get people ready for the coming of Jesus the Christ. So get the weight of this. This is not only an announcement of the birth of a son for Zacharias, this is the announcement of the coming of the Christ. You see the hymn reference is hard to pick up on. If you have a King James or another translation where they don't capitalize it, I'm with you on that. But the angel then directly quotes Malachi. 4, 5, and 6, which talks about the coming of the Christ and the herald that would precede the Christ's arrival. Which would make the hymn here very obvious as being the Messiah. Zacharias is a priest, and above most, he should have picked up on what the angel was saying here, right? Quoting Malachi 4, 5, and 6. Now, This prophecy is actually about the second coming of the Christ, mostly. It tells how before the day, Elijah would come to witness to the nations, and the Jews especially, that the Messiah was coming back the second time. This time he's going to be upset. This time he's coming to, not to save, but to judge. And the fulfillment of this can be seen in Revelation 11, 3 to 13. Um, so he's, Elijah will be one of the two witnesses mentioned there. The prophecy in Malachi, though, Jesus himself confirms is also applying to John the Baptist in Matthew 17, 10 through 13, and Mark 9, 11 through 14. So this is an announcement of the first coming. John is coming in the spirit of Elijah. It is like the second coming is going to be, but it's not. Confusing? Yes. God often gives prophecies that have both near and far off fulfillments. That's how he works. 
you get one level of fulfillment sooner and then a complete fulfillment of it later. God sets a pattern. I showed it to you once, so when you see it again, you should have no doubt exactly who's in charge. You're seeing the hand of God at work. And you know, if Zacharias had started asking questions about things like that, hey, clear this up for me, because I thought that was a second coming thing. See, that would have been some good questions. And this whole encounter might have gone down a little differently for him than it does if he had asked some better questions. A good question, one that um, would have showed he was listening and paying attention, might have sounded something like this. So what you're saying is the Christ is about to come. But we don't get that question. Instead, he asked this, verse 18. And Zacharias said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I am old, and my wife is well advanced in years. The question that Zacharias musters up is, how could I possibly believe what you are saying uh, is going to happen because I'm an old fossil now and so is my wife? I mean, the guy just completely missed the point. In there was a prophecy, a promise that the, the Christ was about to come. And your son was going to be a part of that. And he asked, I'm old, how is this going to happen? He's, he's, he's totally focused on the natural. He is totally at this point focused on himself. This is an epic face plan of a question. And before I go any further, I'm not sure I could have done any better. I'm not. I'm, I would hope now I would have to read this, I would do better. How often do we do that? Do we have an encounter with God and we just do something dumb? Which has to tell you how awesome and gracious God is because we give him so many chances to just come down with these idiots. Oh my goodness. That's all he can do is ask me, but I'm old. How's that going to work? I just told you the Messiah is coming. Verse 19. And the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God and was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. So at this point, we get a name for this angel of the Lord. No rank, just a name, unlike some others. Gabriel is one of only three angels given proper names in the accepted canon of the Bible. The other two are Michael, and we get his rank, he is an archangel, and the third is Lucifer. Only three angels named within the Bible. Gabriel seems to be God's go-to guy for messianic announcements. Gabriel is mentioned three times in the Bible. We see him here announcing the birth of John, the herald of the Christ. He also announces shortly hereafter the birth of Christ, the birth of Jesus to Mary. But well, we also see him all the way back in Daniel chapter 9, where he gives the 70 weeks prophecy to Daniel that sets, by the way, the exact date when the Christ would enter into Jerusalem to be heralded by the people as their future king before being cut off. And that happened exactly when God said it would on Palm Sunday. That prophecy, when the prophecy is triggered, to when it happens, exactly. The people literally should have known today is the day the Messiah arrives in Jerusalem and then sitting at the gate waiting for him. That's how good God is. So the answer to how can Zacharias believe what he says is because I'm Gabriel. And I stand in the presence of God and I've been sent here to bring you the good news. Verse 20, but behold, you will be mute and not able to speak until the day these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their own time. So, for not believing what the giant glowing angel standing in the temple of God told him, <laughs> Zacharias will be unable to speak until the prophecy that he has just been given happens. And I have to say this feels a little harsh. I think God can take the criticism. 
I'm not criticizing, I'm just standing where I'm standing, it feels a little harsh. But because of that, I have to believe that there is more going on than meets the eye. That the question was asked out of unbelief, or maybe even resentment. I have to believe that there is a condition of Zacharias' heart that God is taking to task or seeking to correct. It's more, it's just from what we read, that sounds harsh. So I believe because God is good that there's more going on than we don't see. But as we will see, for sure, this is used to add to the miraculous nature of the child's birth and draw further attention to the future herald of the coming Christ. Again, I think that's by design. Verses 21 and 22. And the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he lingered so long in the temple. But when he came out, he could not speak to them, and they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned to them and remained speechless. So when the hot coal bearers exited down the steps of the temple, the people would have known that the third priest was inside praying. Um, not that there's a set time for such things, but they would have known when he should have started praying. And after a while, you know, they begin to wonder, what's up? Well, it's taking so long. This happens twice a day, every day. So they have an idea how long the guys should been staying there. Nobody's got a stopwatch, but this is going longer than usual. What's what's up? And they begin to stir, and maybe, maybe hopes begin to rise that that priest had heard from God. No one had for 400 years at this point. Maybe today. Maybe today was that day. And so they begin to wonder what's going on. And when he does emerge, something is up. He's waving his hands around. <laughs> waving his hands around, trying to tell them something, but he does not, nor can he say a word to them. So their conclusion from all this is that Zacharias, the old priest, must have had a vision while he was in the temple. Now remember, the whole multitude of people are gathered in the courts of the temple to witness this. They all see this. Word is going to get around. People are going to talk. There's going to be a lot to talk about in the marketplace today. Out in the vineyards, everywhere, people are going to be talking about this event and this man. They don't know it yet, but yes, God has finally spoken. God has finally spoken after 400 years and announced that the Christ is about to arrive. There is a buzz around this old priest now, and that will carry over to a buzz being around the miraculous birth of his son, and that buzz will carry over to that child. God is turning all eyes to see and ears to hear what this child will have to say to them even before he's born. God is setting the stage for the grandest of all events to finally happen. And not just happen, but happen and be noticed. What good would it be if nobody heard about it? Strange things are afoot in Israel this day. Verses 23, 24, and 25. So it was, as soon as the days of his service were completed, that he departed to his own house. Now after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and she hid herself five months, saying, Thus the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. So Zacharias goes home, and shortly thereafter, Elizabeth conceived. This was by natural means. This is not an immaculate conception like Jesus had the normal way, which would be interesting now that Zacharias can't talk. Are you writing notes? In the Just interesting. I don't know. We do know, we don't know, we do not know if Zacharias told Elizabeth what happened in the temple. We would assume something got shared. But when she conceived, she sees it for what it is, a true miracle and a blessing. God. Now it says here that she hid herself away for five months. And when I initially read this, I 
I did the whole Zacharias thing, and I looked at this in the natural, I'm like, well, of course. She didn't know about the prophecy, and she probably wore baggy clothes and hid herself away because she was afraid that she would miscarry. Um, and some people think that's what's being said here, but when you really look at the flow of this, now after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and she hid herself away five months, saying, Thus the Lord has, and, and this would be better rendered, done for me in the days that he looked on me to take away my reproach. So you get a flow, you get a... She hid herself away for this reason, for what she's saying here. So I don't think she's hiding herself away. Um, she is going away for, for this time during which her pregnancy would actually be least noticeable. So we, we don't think, I don't think she's really hiding her pregnancy. If you see this flow, it sounds more like she sent herself away in reverence to God for this great gift. She spent that time contemplating the miracle of this child and contemplating what God's plans for him were and praising God for having taken away the reproach that she once um, had once been upon her in society. She took this time to devote herself to God. God, with this pregnancy, as I stated in the beginning, is vindicating her faithfulness to Him. Something that people in their ignorance had questioned. No one would any longer be able to accuse her of being unrighteous behind her back. Even when she thought all hope was gone and her prayer would not be answered, Elizabeth continued to walk in the ways of God and her faithfulness made her the right person at the right time through which could God, God could bring into the world the herald of the Christ. And she caught the weight of that. And she spent five months focusing on God to be ready for that child to come. So, how do we wrap this up this week? Yeah, we picked up on this. If you haven't picked up on this, God hears every single prayer we ever pray. And He promised, He has promised us in so many places that He will not withhold anything that is good for us from us. I'll give you two. Matthew 7, 7 through 11. Ask and it will be given to you Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks and he asks receives. And he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who if his son asks for bread will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish will give him a serpent? If you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good gifts? Things to those who ask him. In Romans 8 32, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? No prayer goes unanswered, and no prayer, that we're, nothing we ask for that would be good for us will God deny us. If God hears every prayer, He also in some way answers every prayer. Generally in one three way. Yes, no, not now. Sometimes not now is silence. No answer at all. Everyone likes to hear yes. I don't think we have to spend a lot of time on that, do we? Everyone likes to hear yes or see what we just asked for just happened. We all, I mean, nobody, no explanation needed there. We like that. But no is also an answer. If no is the answer, and we know and believe that God is good, and we believe His promises that nothing that is good for us will be held withheld from us, then we have to conclude, right? We must conclude that what we have asked for, that He said no to, absolutely must not be good for us. 
But there is one other possibility for a no answer. Sometimes what we ask for is a good thing, but it's not what is best. Sometimes we ask for too little. Sometimes God says no to good things so that he can give us something way better than what we've ever, ever even thought to ask for. Heather is that for me. Do you trust him to make that call for you? That is complete trust. Do you trust God on that level? God will do some amazing things with people who have complete trust trust in Him. Now sometimes the answer is not now, but wait. Do you trust God enough to accept that answer? Yes, you can have it, but in my time. I am absolutely sure that Zacharias and Elizabeth would have much rather had their son when they were young and spry. I'm sure that they would have wanted to skip the years of having people look sideways at them because they had no children. I'm sure of that. Absolutely sure of that. But God did not want to give them just a son, but a son to whom the Christ would be introduced to the world. A son who would turn the religious order in Israel on its ear. A son who would, after 400 years of silence, finally bring a word of God from God to people. And the word that he brought would be the greatest news for all time that the Christ is here. That is what God wanted to give them. But the time wasn't right, so he had them wait. And when they least expected it, they got way more than they ever could have hoped to even think to ask for. That's our God. Staying faithful puts you in a position to be used by God and blessed in ways that you cannot possibly imagine. That is not a guarantee that such a thing will happen. But you certainly take yourself out of the running for it if you aren't faithful. So we walk. Individually and together, we walk in the faith that God is good and He loves us. And we live this life with the hope that through our faithfulness, He can do much to bring glory to His name. Even when He says no to our prayers, even when He says wait, even when He is silent. And we do all that because knowing Him is worth it. Even if he never gave us another thing other than salvation, he's worth it. Amen. Spending eternity with God among the untold riches of heaven is worth more than anything he can possibly give us in this life. You get that. Even if God gave us the whole world, it's going to burn. It will be nothing compared to eternity with him in heaven. God could give you the whole world and it would pale in comparison to eternity with him. And that's why we do it. That's why we walk faithful. That's why we accept. We, no? Okay. We trust you. And I'm living for that. I'm living for eternity. That's what Elizabeth and Zacharias did. And look what God was able to do with them. Imagine what he can do with us. Imagine what he has done with a couple of us. Amen? Amen. 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 Father, let us really leave here today with a sense of how much you love us. And how if we will just stay faithful to you, that your faithfulness to us can be poured out in the measure that you want to. Help us to live for you, to live for your glory, to live for the good of each other, to live for the good of the world around us by sharing the gospel of Jesus everywhere we go. Help 
humble us before you today so that we really know the awesomeness that we stand before, the awesomeness that is in our lives and working for our good. Never let us forget that. Bless us now, O Lord. And all these things we ask in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen.